Joe's faith was immensely strong, but quite unorthodox. And whereas I'm a dogmatist and care about form and how it's done and ceremony, she just had this enormous heart full of love and she practiced that completely. We took the mickey out of her for taking in her waifs and strays in life, you know, the autistic gardener who couldn't find any work anywhere else, the Shetland pony that was going to be sent to the knacker's yard. And of course, after she'd gone, I realised that I was kind of one of her waifs and strays as well, and I was part of her huge mission of the heart. I'm serious. Yeah. You know? <laughs> she was very loving. She was very loving in a very tough way. I yeah. mean, as in she she just took people in, but she um, took no prisoners. <laughs> she was great. <laughs> yeah. I'm journalist Colin Brazier, and eight months ago I lost my wife of 20 years to breast cancer. It's heartening to remember her with our family friend, Kate McKenzie. Kate wrote a brilliant eulogy and helped me organise Joe's funeral. Would you please stand? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Around the world today, there will be lives that come to an end. The customs and rituals of how those lives will be remembered are richly diverse from culture to culture and faith to faith, and in many instances unchanged for thousands of years. But my experience is here in the UK. So, for heart and soul on the BBC World Service, I want to look at how attitudes to funerals are changing. What purpose, if any, does a ceremony, religious or otherwise, actually fulfil? Why do more people see the funeral as a celebration of life? As a Catholic, our tradition is that we mourn for a year and a day. What might Christians like me learn from the way other faiths mourn a death? You started talking about the funeral. She hadn't been, she hadn't died in like a couple of hours. I think you really wanted to prepare for a great ceremony. Embedding yourself in the practicalities were a big part of coping with that tumult of those immediate days and weeks that followed her death. And I, I found it very sustaining, the practicality. I mean, you, you know, I moaned about it, of course, about the bills and the death certificates and the having to put things in different names and all that sort of stuff. But actually, all that, plus the funeral, was an amazing diversion. May I begin by welcoming you all here today as we gather to remember, to give thanks for Joe's life, to pray for the repose of her soul. The funeral itself, Joe and I talked about the hymns we'd have, and I wanted to have as the great sort of hymn of the North abide with me. And she said, "You can't. You just can't. You know, it'll have people blubbing unnecessarily." Anyway, I of course slotted it in when she wasn't there to <laughs> to disagree. <laughs> And I'm so glad we did, because not only is it, a, is it such a powerful hymn, but it was the first hymn of the Requiem Mass. And, you know, I processed up the aisle with... Um, with your girls, didn't you? And John. And, um, and you know, it was a hot day. And there was this gasp as we walked into the... You know, people yes. saw the kids. And, and But Abide With Me sort of settled me down, actually. I tried to got, th got through the first line and then realised that was a bad idea, closed my eyes. And, and by the end of Abide With Me, I was, I was a bit more ready for it, actually. We place on the coffin the Christian symbols of the Book of the Word of God, the Bible, and on, already on there is the cross, the symbol of our faith. I felt so purged by the, the, the Requiem Mass. Maybe it was also because it was incredibly hot, but I felt absolutely emptied out. And so when we got to the graveside, I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing. I felt everything at the Requiem Mass where it was framed by my faith. Joe and I both had Irish ancestry, we weren't always regulars at Mass. In her youth, Joe had been a communist. But like many Catholics, having a family brought us back to the pews. In the weeks after Joe's death and her funeral, I wrote a magazine article. The words were mine, but the sentiments were really hers. We'd talked beforehand about what kind of funeral she wanted to have. Neither of us liked the idea of turning the ceremony into a celebration. We both felt that was baffling for our six children, 
and risk making something that ought to be dignified into something frivolous. Celebrating our time together, yes. Celebrating it was now over, no. Well, the article certainly hit a nerve. It was widely discussed in newspapers and on radio and television. Some people agreed with me that mourners should wear black. Others, especially on social media, thought I was being archaic and judgmental. Very sorry for your loss and the grief of this very sad time. But I think everybody should just quietly hold funerals as they wish and not criticise others for doing it differently. I couldn't have put it better myself. Myself and my children had the celebration funeral for my husband last year, and that is what we wanted, and my husband too. Everyone's grief is different, so no one should be telling people they are wrong and haven't grieved properly. One of my critics was the writer Erica Buist, who's currently researching This Party's Dead, a book on death festivals. One of the reasons I quite like the idea of the celebratory funeral is the attempt to make things not lighter exactly, but sort of much more about the person who's died. And not just that we're sad that they're gone, but why we are and how brilliant they were. What I think that does is it takes it away from us in a way. It takes it away from my fear and it takes it away from the fact that death won again. You know, death, death wins every time. We met in the offices of Westminster Cathedral, the headquarters of Catholicism in England and Wales. As we talked, I realised her views had been shaped by a traditional requiem mass she attended after a friend took his own life. I hated it. I, I counted at least an, uh, 60, 65 minutes where his name wasn't even mentioned. You know, perhaps we should have gone off and done our own memorial for those of us who knew him and had to throw his boots away. The funeral of your friend, Catholic requiem mass, they didn't talk about him for an hour. At least. But that's because they were talking about God. Mm because they were talking about something, perhaps even encouraging people to think beyond themselves. Right. This was my first experience of a funeral, and I was 20, so I was incredibly self-centered, I'm sure, and I, I was, you know, traumatized from what had happened. And yes, my thinking at this time, what I wanted to stand up and yell was, stop talking about Jesus, he already had his funeral, can we please talk about my friend? I, I recognize now. Right, I know, exactly. I, I was thinking, he's had his funeral 2,000 times. I guess this was just the anger of what was going on. And afterwards, I thought, well, what could they have done to satisfy me at that point? Was I angry at them, or was I just angry in general because I didn't understand what had happened? You know, there are, there are volumes in the precincts of the cathedral where we are devoted to eschatology, the study, the Catholic study of, of death. Mm -hmm. And I know when I was at my wife's bedside, her deathbed, with our six children, and our parish priest came around and there was the anointing of the, the last rites. And there were times when I was with her in the hours before her death saying the rosary, that there was enormous comfort to be derived from that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to drive home this idea, it's not just the funeral. Mm -hmm. There are the hours and the days before somebody dies. Okay. And I derived great comfort from my faith in that time. Mm. Yes, I mean, and the thing is, having a faith, I kind of see it as this astonishing privilege that you've got. I remember being, maybe because I went to a religious school, people ask, what do you think? What do you think? But in the end, whether or not you have a faith is, is not something you think about logically. You just have to reach into your chest and pull out what's there. Mm. And, and I'm, I'm so sorry to say what I pulled out was nothing. And, and to be honest, I think it's the increase in people not having a faith that has led to the need for people to feel like they, they can build their own rituals. Because what, you, what, what gave you comfort? What is left for someone like me when we haven't got that? And I just think this is where people just start to make it up. I can't really imagine my life without Sikhi, but I can tell you that having Sikhi in my life prior to meeting my husband and all through our life together has suddenly given me understanding and also tools to accept it and to carry on in the way. Sikhism is one of the youngest world religions, but Sukhmani Kaur could still lean on over 500 years of tradition when her husband Jagraj died of cancer in 2017 at the age of 38. He left three children who were six weeks old, eight years old and ten. We met at her local Gurdwara, her temple, in West London. After he died in hospital, prayers were said in her home and there was a short, traditional funeral. 
We had a program every morning and every evening. There would be singing of hymns and there will be discourse of certain hymns which relate to, to death. It was all in English, the discourse was in English, so it was very easy to relate to. And for me personally, it was like counseling because it was the guru would talk to me through these words. At that time, it was really, really comforting and it was just amazing having this continuously for 10 days. It was positive. I know it's weird, but when people who were not practicing Sikhi, they would come to our house, you could see they just didn't know what to do. They were in bits, but all of us who had the faith, we were sort of, you know, his torture is finished, He's, because he was suffering a lot. Yeah. And it's probably the most difficult part, yeah. is the seeing person suffer. It's a kind of, it's a kind of torture, isn't it, really? It is. In terms of disposing of his body, I hate to use that phrase, yeah. but you know, For crematorium? Sort of crematorium, it, it is crematorium, because um, Sikh's been always cremating from, from the beginning, uh, because the body is not seen as a person, the person is the soul, so we come from dust and we go back to dust, mm. so the body is burnt. Do you miss not having somewhere to go? I don't need to go, I can come here. Yeah. I mean, I feel like if his body was here, it will make him, his spirit linger, mm. so obviously then the ashes were left. With the ashes, uh, in Sikhi you dispose of them or you let them go into floating water, uh, we went to India and uh, there is a place where a few of the Sikh gurus were, cre were cremated and then the ashes were flown to the river, so we did it in the same place. I don't know, I, I did feel like I, I'd done my bit. At that moment when we scattered the ashes into the river, I did feel that, you know, I did let go and it was sort of a, a closing point for me. Speaking to Sukmani, I didn't hear the word celebration, just the acceptance he had gone with ancient prayers and rituals that gave her comfort as she faced raising their young family without him. We decided that Jo should be buried, and as a family we make mini pilgrimages to her grave. It may sound a little macabre, but I even draw comfort, understanding at least, from the thought of her body, a body I knew so intimately, being reunited, slowly, with the earth around her. Catholicism, with its emphasis on the senses, to me seems at odds with the instant sterility of cremation. That isn't celebration, though, as we understand the word. <laughs> Ed Hussein is a journalist and the author of The House of Islam. His father died in the border region between Bangladesh and India in 2016. I had to wait four weeks for various logistical reasons before my late wife Jo was buried. That felt quite a long time. It felt sufficiently long for me to feel distracted by the planning process. I'm guessing there's probably, you know, back in the mists of time, there is probably some back in the Arabian Peninsula, bodies had to be disposed of quickly. I, I'm, I'm guessing there are falls and against, I'm trying to think what the, the pros are, mm -hmm. because it's quite raw, two or three days after your father died, you're, you're still in shock, aren't you, in a mm. sense? Mm. Whereas I was slightly beyond the shock phase. And I, I entirely agree that there is a logistical and kind of Arabian Peninsula sun consideration from where Islam was born or Judaism was born. But I, I think ultimately the argument can go both ways, can't it? You've then spent four weeks in the company of your beloved in, in an incapacitated state. I, I then had three weeks of just regularly going to visit my father's I hate calling it a grave, you know, mm. tomb, shrine, resting place. Why three weeks? Was that prescribed? Forty days are prescribed as a time of mourning. Um, did you seek to observe that, those 40 I, days? I did, yes. Yes, by, by going as often as possible. It's and funny how 40 days keeps cropping up, doesn't it? You know, Lent. Lent. 40 and 40 keeps coming up in the Old Testament mm. and the New Testament. You're absolutely right. But I, I think 40 basically meant many. <laughs> and we, you know, it was, um, oh, don't demystify it no, too much. No, well, okay, fair enough. Yeah, so, but but I, I, I just think that you try to remember it as, as long as possible and you keep going back again and again. And, and you're going every day? Pretty much. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, and, and slowly it petered out to about every every other day because in the, in the first week or so the emotions were, as you say rightly, very very raw. You know the the outbursts, the pain, the uncontrollable weeping, and the dreams. Many more signs that keep appear that someone somewhere is watching you over you. I mean, it's just you've got to have that kind of cognitive metaphysical opening to those to observe those. 
And then they slowly start to go away until you look out for them more consciously. So spending more time with the deceased's body has its upsides, but also knowing that the body's there and the soul is looking on you also has its virtues, I think. The rest of the world actually is, is not growing more secular. But there are strands within Western society where things are becoming much more secular. I observe, and it concerns me slightly, that there is, a, it seems to me, a move towards the medicalization of grief. By which I mean that when my wife died, it for me it was entirely explicable. She'd had cancer. She had six years of quite a decent quality of life. This gave us time to prepare. That was wonderful. When she died, it was unbearably sad. But it was only sad. It wasn't the cause of me going to a psychiatrist or a counsellor and saying, explain this phenomena to me. So my question really is whether we feel as men of faith that the role of faith is in danger of being supplanted by a secular toolkit based around psychology. That's probably the greatest danger we face as a species, that our loss of meaning in life. And it's dangerous because when meaning is lost, when purpose is lost, there's nothing for which we can live. The, the greatest encounter after our, our birth is the fact that we will die. And if we can't explain that, by all means mock and, and question the religious narrative. But if you don't have anything to replace it with, if your answer is, oh, we just live and we just die and we're just atoms, we undermine the very premise on which civilization, humanity, meaning, purpose, all of that is built on those divine teachings. All of the philosophers, right the way down to Nietzsche, believed in a God, believed in meaning, believed in the accountability of our deeds in the next life, as did Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, all of them. We throw all that out as kind of if they were all dead white men. What are we replacing it with? Again, the idea of celebration wasn't something Ed and I talked about, just a strict observance of the rites that have been used to mark the deaths of Muslims for generations. It was important to Ed, as it was to me, that he felt he was memorialising his father in the right way, but also to keep up those traditions so they don't fade away. Even in loss, there is continuity and renewal. I'm journalist Colin Brazier, and for Heart and Soul from the BBC World Service, I'm looking at mourning rituals following the death of my wife eight months ago. Death is something that affects us all. It tests our faith and our ideas around faith. So please join in the conversation on social media using the hashtag BBC Heart and Soul. There's a phrase that I've used for many years now that says, actually, if it's legal and decent, then it's something that we do and we will organise. David Collingwood is the director of funerals at the Co-op Funeral Care. David has been in the business for 32 years and has witnessed the decline in religious ceremonies. I would say probably more than half of the people that we talk to have little or no connection. Is there a danger that we embrace what is effectively a relativistic free-for-all? I'm reading a co-op funeral press release here. The McDonald's funeral, this ceremony was for a teenager who was a huge fan of McDonald's. The funeral procession drove via the local McDonald's. Would you be comfortable conducting those ceremonies? I'd be very proud if I knew that that was the wishes of that family or the deceased, I absolutely, genuinely would Even be very proud. Even though you'd proud. probably have to set aside any prejudices or over 30, accumulated over 32 years of good practice. If I'm a funeral director, I should never, ever impose my will or my beliefs on anyone else. Should, my, anybody, my, my, should anybody impose their will and their opinions and their feelings on... Or should, we, or should we just let it be a free-for-all? Well, you, you talk about free-for-all, I would say to you, because I, I, you know, I wouldn't agree, I would say that this is about choice, and this is about informed choice at a very difficult time. Now, there are examples of funerals, but those funerals were right for, for those people those people and for that family that sense of knowing that you have done right by the person that has passed away you, we you can't see we nothing, can't ignore you see, that, you see david you don't think there's anything potentially wrong we can't ignore how comforting and beneficial that will be in somebody's uh, grieving okay. and coping Let, with grief. Let's, just in case people think i'm a complete headbanger there, there is a there is a contra view here which says actually if you're having a, fu a funeral for a teenager at mcdonald's what you are doing is effectively denying death its state you are turning something that's terribly sad into something, in quotes, uplifting and celebratory. As somebody who lost his wife a few months ago, I can tell you I did not want to celebrate her death. 
I can understand that, and there, but there is a large proportion of people, and, and you know, you you had choice, Colin. You chose the right kind of funeral for your wife, for you, and for your family. You know what, David? I don't think I did have that much choice. I think the choice was laid down before me as as a Catholic who went to mass. The funeral, the requiem mass, was held in the same same church that we went to mass in every week, conducted by the parish priest who I knew. The choice was limited. It, it, the the choice was yours to do that. That you could have you could have decided not to do that, but you knew that was right for you. Everyone's grief is unique to them. Other than the rise of the celebratory funeral, business is booming in direct cremation. I distinctly remember in my job as a television newsreader here in the UK, being on air and announcing the death of the musician David Bowie. We were all expecting a huge celebrity funeral, but instead his body was cremated with no service and no ceremony. And that's a trend that's now catching on. So a direct cremation is when you dispose of a body without any form of ceremony or funeral. So the direct cremation provider will go to the hospital, for example, to collect the person who has died. They'll usually be stored in a warehouse somewhere and then they will be disposed of in the crematorium and the ashes will be returned to the family at a later date. So nobody attends, no one sees the person who has died and that's direct cremation at its most brutal. I went to Louise Winter's home in West London. She runs Poetic Endings and describes herself as a progressive funeral director. Like me, she's wary of the celebratory funeral with funny ties and pop music, especially where they've been organised by big funeral directors. But a service doesn't need religion to have meaning. Personally, I'm not a fan of when you just take a funeral, a very traditional funeral with the funeral directors wearing their stripes and, you know, doing what they always do and then just make them wear a pink feather boa or something like that. It doesn't feel like genuine personalisation. It's just taking the templated ceremony and you know, sticking a pink feather bearer on it. I think what we're talking about has to go much deeper than that to actually acknowledge the emotions that people are going through. You are a, you are a business, not a religion. You're swimming against a tide that's been flowing for thousands of years. Organised religion have developed rituals and ceremonies around the process of last things, as they call them in the Catholic Church. Uh, you're making this stuff up on the hoof. What's the rationale, really? Oh, I don't think we're quite making it up. <laughs> um, um, it, the wisdom of ages has not been distilled as it has been under Hinduism, mm -hmm. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all of which have got their own techniques, methods and ceremonies yeah. over thousands of years. There's a difference. Yes, but if it's not relevant and meaningful to the way that you've lived life and the society you have grown up with then introducing those things at a time when someone who is die has died it's not going to be helpful when we're working with people and often it is because they have no faith because usually if they are going to have a religious funeral they will go to a funeral director who will specialize in facilitating that they usually come to us because they don't have any of those starting points and that's why going through that emotional bit of talking through you know what are you feeling what feels right what doesn't feel right is really important where's it going in the future do you think i mean you, you're fighting a rearguard action to stop the unstoppable it seems to me that the the david bowie model of the body just being disposed with no ritual no ceremony that feels like the coming thing it does. I think it's worrying, it's disturbing, and what we're trying to do as modern progressive funeral directors is create a way of dealing with funerals that is meaningful and relevant so people don't feel like they have to dismiss them. And what I'm hopeful for is that people in 30 years will have embraced this. I think direct cremation fits now because we are all about dismissing everything and trying to get rid of the, glossing over the difficult bits. But there's another generation, my generation, who are embracing sobriety. We go to yoga, we all have therapists, we spend all our money on looking after ourselves and talk about self-care all the time. And I don't think that direct cremation is going to work for that generation. So really, I'm, Poetic Endings is going to be more relevant in 30 years, I think, than it is now. 30 years from now, I may or may not be alive. But until my dying day, Joe's funeral will stay with me as a source of pride. For our six children, it mattered that 600 people were there to remind them 
by sheer weight of numbers how much mummy was cherished. And for me, it mattered that my magnificent Bolshe wife, such a force of love in life, should make a statement in death. For the recessional music, we're going to hear a recording of A Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square, sung by Joe. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Because the funeral was her way of saying, don't be a slave to fashion. Sometimes the old stuff works, even if it does seem obsolete. Which isn't, of course, to say rituals can't be tinkered with. As her funeral ended, we played a recording of Joe singing a favourite song. And a So perhaps we did celebrate Joe just in a way that also celebrated our faith and the rituals that go with it. Well, I'm, I'm Colin Brazier and this has been a year and a day for Heart and Soul from the BBC World Service. The producer was Henrietta Harrison.